I'm going to uh, introduce our next panel. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance, but we actually have um, two Mars rovers here at uh, Brainstorm Tech. There's a little golf cart sized one outside in the courtyard and it is called Reba. And it's a full scale replica of the twin rovers Spirit and Opportunity. And they were launched in the summer of 2003. They arrived on Mars in January of 2004 and they are still there. Uh, there's a bigger uh, one in the lobby, and it's called Curiosity, and that is scheduled to be launched in the fall of 2011, and it will travel farther, last longer, and go where no rover has gone before. The rovers are on display here, courtesy of Caltech and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory here in Pasadena, and we are honored to have as our guest today Dr. Jean-Lou Camot, the president of Caltech, and I'd like to thank Dr. Chameau for his help in bringing the rovers here to, to Brainstorm Tech. At the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab, teams of scientists have been designing space, space exploration crafts and blazing trails through the universe since the 1930s. Dr. Charles Alachi leads the team at JPL, and we are very pleased to welcome him to Brainstorm Tech in conversation with Jeffrey O'Brien, who covers science, technology, and innovation for the magazine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Charles Alachi and Jeff O'Brien. Thank you, Stephanie. So we generally frown upon uh, presentations, but we have, uh, I, I like robots a lot, and so I have uh, made an exception. We have a little video that I want to run before we talk. Flight now. Go now. The Doppler signature indicates through stage separation has occurred. Copy that. All systems are go for entry, descent, landing. We are currently six minutes from landing at the GOSEP crater in the southern hemisphere of Mars. Expected parachute deploy in five seconds. We are awaiting confirmation the parachute has deployed. Parachute was detected. Current altitude 8,000 feet. Expected retro rocket ignition on my mark. Mark. <laughs> Awaiting confirmation from the spacecraft that retro rocket ignition has occurred. At this point in time, we should be on the ground. And now, six minutes 37 seconds from atmospheric entry. Still awaiting signal that we are on the ground.
Very cool. <laughs> Dr. Alachi, thank you for coming. I think that it's fair to say that um, we have a, a self-selecting group of uh, technologists here, uh, people who are pro-innovation, who are uh, finan financiers, of, uh, you know, technological entrepreneurs. Um, it's probably fair to say that many of us are, are, are pro-space. Uh, we wonder about the great unknown. There may be even a few in here who, in the crowd who are planning uh, vacations to, you know, the International Space Station. But that said, I think that I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, start out with what I think is um, the most obvious question. You know, at a time when everybody is facing cutbacks, uh, massive federal and state deficits, you have a, a, a billion and a half dollar annual budget at JPL. And um, what, are we, what, are, what are you doing with our money? Oh. <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, I mean, the reason I wanted to show this video, you know, at the beginning, is to, to highlight the challenges that we have in space exploration and the innovation which is needed to be, allow us to do that. Because our economy is fundamentally dependent on innovation. And everything around us, I mean, we're all technologists here, but I tell my neighbor, almost everything they do has technology in it. And that resulted from somebody taking some major challenge in the past, which led to some innovation, which became at the heart of our economy. So my philosophy is, when things are tough, this is the time to invest. This is not the time to go back and sit in our shell and just worry about the little things. If we want to, keep, if we want to continue being the economic power that our country has been, I think we need to continuously be ahead of the game, investing in innovation, developing new technology, and I believe the best way of developing new technology, at least in my, my thing, is not to wake up one day and say, well, I'm going to innovate today. The way innovation works is you take a group of smart people, you give them something which seems almost impossible you know, to do, and then you get them do it, to do it. And as they do it, they have to innovate. You know, to do that. Otherwise, it would not have been almost impossible. Right. So that's, you know, you take one example in space exploration. What we're doing with your $1.6 billion, I'm sure you would like to have it, right. uh, is that we take some very challenging jobs which expand our knowledge, which people say it's almost impossible. I don't think you can do this. And then as we're doing it, we have to develop technology of digital coding. We have to develop very light electronics. We have to develop very power efficient electronic, we have to develop things which locate our spacecraft extremely accurately, and then an entrepreneur comes and says, ah, I can take this and make a cell phone out of it, or I can make it for a GPS, or I can make it for image processing, and so on. So, so that's 40 years do. after we landed on the moon, we have a Heineken commercial to show for it, and a commemorative issue of Time Magazine. We have touchstone of popular culture. But what you're claiming is that there's a lot of filtered uh, innovation that trickles down from... Well, let me give you a couple of examples, you know, from the past and a couple of examples of what we, what we do today. 20, 30 years ago, we had the challenge of how do we... Our spacecraft, to give you an idea about the so size of the solar system, I'm sure you are all educated, but the Voyager spacecraft, which is at the edge of our solar system, the signal takes 24 hours at the speed of light to get from the spacecraft to Earth. So if you do your math, that's many billions of, of miles to do that. And we have only 20 watts. That's about the light bulb in your refrigerator. So to be able to communicate, people had to develop lightweight electronics. We had to develop coding. Some of you hear about the Viterbi code or the Salmon code, which are now used in very many cell phones and so on. Those had to be developed for doing what seemed to be almost impossible. Uh, when you go to the doctor now, you get all this image enhancement that you get. Though not many people appreciate that the early image enhancement was developed at JPL to enhance the images we are getting from satellite. Not that I knew there is a business there, right. but we needed to do that tough problem. And then an innovator or an entrepreneur picked that and they made something of it. If we speak today, we are experimenting today using some of our infrared detectors that we are developing for telescopes, which are very sensitive. The doctors are trying them to see can they detect cancerous cells. You know, when they do a cancer operation, they want to check, have they taken all the cancerous cells out? It turned out some cancerous cells have a little bit higher temperatures than healthy cells. And that could open a whole new technological, in the medical field, a whole new technological area. So these are some examples of the things where you don't plan them, because that's not how innovation works. But by doing something very challenging, 
all of a sudden there is all kinds of payoff. Well, well of course, it's not the most, in a, the most efficient route to, to innovation. I mean, you know, funding an entire you know, space exploration to get GPS. Um, but, but that said, um, I'm more of a fanboy than anything. And so I, I, I want to sort of celebrate what you're, what you're doing. And, and you have 19 uh, spacecraft that are out there now. Can you tell me you know, what's, what's the end goal? Um, what are we up to out there? Yeah. I think the primary goal that we're trying to do to expand our knowledge about where we are in the solar system and about life, how it has evolved. Uh, one simple example usually I give to people is that somehow 13 billion years ago there was a Big Bang and a bunch of particles were formed. And somehow these particles got together and they formed galaxies and stars and planets and on one of this planet, somehow these particles got together and they formed cells and here there is smart people like you and I Aren't you wondering how did that happen? Mm. How did that start with a bunch of particles and here we are smart people doing that? And is this common in the universe or are we unique? Is our DNA something very common or is it something different? There are other kind of DNA which are in this universe. So what we are trying to do in space exploration is to write what I call the history book of how, did we, how we came about you know, in here. And in that process, we learn a lot about the evolution of our planet. Why did our planet end being a blue dot when Mars and Venus, which are very close to us, ended being a red dot and a very hot dot. You know, and, their, and life did not evolve on them. They weren't always extremely cold and extremely hot. And that's exactly right, because when they early started, three, four billion years ago, we were very similar. Uh, what Spirit and Opportunity did, we discovered for fact now that about three billion years ago, there were liquid oceans on Mars, and somehow they disappeared. So the question, and thir three billion years ago is when life started on Earth, so somehow, life evolved on our planet, and somehow on Mars either it, it evolved but it didn't kick off completely, or it did not evolve. So the question, why did that happen? And what was unique that we need to preserve in our planet so we can continue the life that we have here? Right, so how, how difficult is it? I mean, these people seem pretty happy, right? <laughs> I mean, um, it, the copy room when Lashinsky hits a deadline sort of reacts the same way. What, um, how difficult is it to get those rope, you know, to get spare an opportunity? And also, yeah. they were supposed to last 90 days, right? And they've been going for what, five years? Five years what, what do you attribute that to? Well, first about the question that people are happy there. The reason they are happy because the chance, it was a risky endeavor. Like people say, you don't clap when you land your airplane. Because you know that's pretty safe, right. you've done it, you know how to do that and so on. Here, the likelihood of success was not necessarily very high. And the reason is, one, we were coming in at 12,000 miles per hour. And in six minutes, we had to stop and land softly. So the title of this video, you didn't see the title. It's called The Six Minutes of Terror. Because you have so much, thousands of things have to work right. And only one thing which goes wrong and you crash you know, on the planet. We needed to come with the accuracy of entry uh, I usually give a simplistic example, mostly for the media, not for the high-tech people, that if you go outside and you hit the golf ball towards St. Andrews in England, that has to come straight in the cup. That's how accurate we have to get there. And just to make it a little bit more challenging, the cup is moving at high speed, and you still have to get there. So we had to develop the technology of accurate tracking, triangulation you know, with the ground system, very high accuracy clocks that are used you know, to be able to do the timing extremely accurately. And those found their ways in the next generation of GPS system you know, that the Air Force is deploying now. Uh, now, why did they survive? Uh, it is a combination of being smart but also being lucky. Uh, we were concerned that because they are solar powered, I mean, these rovers run on a couple hundred watts. Because they are solar powered, we were afraid that there will be dust which will accumulate on them. And after a while, you don't have enough power to run them. Well, it turned out on Mars there are dust devils, similar to what you see in the desert here, and every once in a while, dust devil comes in and just cleans the rovers. And all of a sudden, we get power exactly the way it was when we landed. Now, they are getting older. You know, one rover has one wheel which have failed out of the six wheels. Another rover is driving like this because their arm, you know, is not working very well, so we get arthritis on it. So it happened like all of us, you know, after a while, you know, you get old. Right. But we always figured out a way to, to manage and work that. If there are questions, um, please uh, send a question on Spot Me or, or find someone with a microphone. What, um, what are the next decade, what are the next 10 years or so look like? What's on your agenda? Yeah, if, if we look at the next decade of what are the major things that we'll be doing in, in robotic exploration, one, I would think that 
uh, we will have and will continue to have permanent presence on another planet, in this case specifically Mars, to really understand how that planet functions. Uh, it will be similar to what we have in Antarctica. We have permanent scientific stations, except here they are robotic. Now, we have been on Mars for 10 years between orbiters and landers, and Mars is about the size of the land mass on Earth. So basically, over the next decade, we'll be understanding how another planet actually functions and how does it compare to our planet. The other one we'll be able to say 10 years from now, if we have a similar conference, is to tell you if life actually exists on other planets in our solar system. Uh, does it exist on Europa, which has an ocean? Why do we care about life? Uh, because we want to know, number one, again, as I said earlier, were we something unique which evolved, or is our, the kind of life, the DNA, the carbon-based life, is that the same life in other places? Or is it unique here and there is some silicon kind of life, you know, which is happening on other planet? Uh, the third one we'll be able to do in the next uh, dec decade is to give you what I call a family portrait of the neighboring 2,000 solar systems. We'll be looking at the neighboring 2,000 stars, and we'll tell you if they have planets, and we'll tell you which one of them have planets similar to ours. That means it has the right environment for habitability, the way we know it, or it might be different. And the last one, I would say, is basically to better and bring all of that to understand better what's happening on our planet, and basically have the in-depth understanding of the changes which are occurring, the carbon dioxide impact on our planet, the greenhouse effect, and so on. So our policymakers can make smart decisions, which have major economic implications, particularly if we do treaties related to carbon dioxide and green energy. This has trillions of dollars of implication. So we want to make sure we provide the scientifically based information that then smart people can make decisions with that. So I know that you oversee robotic space exploration, but I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you, uh, <laughs> is there any reason for, for human uh, manned ex space exploration? No, I mean, also, that's a very good question. The way I, I put it is the following. We do exploration for a variety of reasons. We do exploration for scientific reason, for economic reason, for national pride, for uh, national security, and so on. In some of those, the robotic are better off. I mean, for most of the scientific purposes, robotic can do a lot of that activity. But if we want to expand our presence, uh, if we want to do some of the things like when we repaired the Hubble telescope about a couple of months ago, we still need humans you know, with their intelligence to be able to do some very complicated function. It's more expensive, but it's needed. So again, when we talk about exploration, we need to think about what is the purpose that our nation is doing exploration. And we shouldn't underestimate the, the political and international implication. One thing I give as an example, uh, when we landed uh, Phoenix, you know, it was last Memorial Day a year ago, we were on every front cover newspaper in the world, above the fold, all this thing. And that was the day after a congressman was telling me he was in Pakistan, and everybody was bashing the United States, you know, because of variety of reasons. And the following day, everybody was admiring the United mm -hmm. States, for our boldness, for our imaginativeness, and so on. So we shouldn't underestimate the, the variety of benefit that the country gets from basically going and seeing one movie, each citizen seeing one movie a year. That's what the budget of JPL. If you cut down on seeing one movie a year, each adult, that's what will fund all that activities that you are seeing here. I wish I could give back the latest Transformers. We have one over there. Hi, if you look back at the last 100 years of scientific advancements, you could say that uh, a significant uh, enabler of that has been our ability to precisely measure things like time, mass, distance, uh, position. What do you see as the next uh, exquisite measurement instrument that's going to enable an advance in technology? Uh, that, that's a good question about it because we, we measure the vast majority of the parameters, but I think one of the most fundamental, really fundamental, intriguing thing to do is really to understand uh, what I call dark energy and dark matter. And what that is, I mean, it sounds exotic, and it is exotic, but we found that if you look at the galaxies and how the universe is expanding, the laws, that, the fundamental laws that we have now, which is the gravity measurement and so on, uh, cannot explain that. So a number of scientists believe that actually 90 to 95% of the universe is made of material that we cannot see in the way, in the technology that we have today. And that the energy, which is, you know, that, you know, the energy we're familiar with, is actually negative. You know, things are expanding more than instead of being attracted. 
Now, would that lead to some fundamental discovery? No question. Would that lead to major technology? Who knows? You know, is when we harness the energy of the atom. You know, that created a whole new positive or negative, depending how you use it, you know, to do that. So I think these are some of the examples of the fundamental understanding uh, that we still are not there, you know, to do that. And that could revolutionize many of our, you know, technology. We just have a minute or so, and I, I want to shift gears just really quickly and away from technology and, and more toward maybe uh, management theory a little bit. Um, you are inspiring your people to do what you have described as effectively impossible. Right? Do you, have you learned lessons that maybe you can impart to the audience on, who are going through maybe, maybe not exactly the same type of situation, but analogous in their own minds? No, I, I mean, my belief, particularly in our field, in the high-tech high field, I mean, you need people who have passion to what they do, which I'm sure many of you probably have passion, you know, to do that, uh, and have a goal beyond just the immediate benefit. I mean, I tell our employees, if you are here just to get a job and to make money, we are the wrong place, you know, for you. Now, we still pay them so they don't take a 10 cup, you know, trying to, to get their food and so on. But you have to have passion to what you do, and you have to have boldness, and you have to be prepared to make mistakes. You know, we do fail sometimes. I mean, we are showing you here things which were successful. I have another video which shows some of the failures that we have. And every once in a while failing, even that we try to avoid it, my first reaction when we have a failure is not to blame anybody. My first reaction is, okay, how do we get out of that problem and how do we learn from it, you know, to do that. And that creates an environment of innovation where people are willing to take a risk, even that there is a probability that you might not. So I think that's a critical thing we found from doing the kind of work we do. Uh, I never ever blame somebody because they fail. And the general saying I tell people, if we have a successful mission, the project manager will be on the podium. If the mission fail, I will be up on the podium. And I think that's something that we all can learn from, you know, to encourage people to learn from their mistakes and not to be afraid from pushing the limit. Well said, thank you very much, Dr. Sure. Thank you, Enjoy. my pleasure.